And thank you so much to all of our team that's been part of our service today, our worship team. Thank you guys so much. What a blessing. George on the guitar. Just really appreciate you being willing to do that. And Javier and Eva, the thoughtfulness that you put into it. Jeff, for being part of it. And, uh, that lovely lady in red in the middle. That was that was a highlight for me. Um, you know, and to Nassim doing everything as, as our elder and running video and everything. And uh, our greeters, just appreciate the church coming together so we can have a, a, a great service together. Um, appreciate what, what Eva mentioned, um, too, just about things going on. And I just want to begin. Are, are you staying focused? Are you staying focused? I, I hope that you are. I hope that, I hope that despite everything the devil's doing to distract and to depress and discourage, I hope that you are staying focused focused and uh you know there's a reason that you're here today it's not by accident it's not an arbitrary reality whether you're a visitor maybe you're here just for our uh part of our program or or, or something like that but whatever the reason is god had a reason for you being here today now that reason may have been uh evident uh, from something earlier in our service or maybe even sabbath school and maybe that reason will become a greater understood later in the day in potluck. Maybe it's supposed to be because of what we experience right now. I don't know. But there is a reason that you are here. And God has a plan to speak to you today. And he wants to get to your heart. How many of you watched the movie Ice Age last week? Did any of you? A couple of you did? You know, there's those things that once you experience it in one context, you can't get it out of your head. And and uh, I hope that analogy was fun for you last week. Uh, today, I'm going to continue on this idea of the importance of serving our kids and our young people um, by looking at a Bible story. But before we get into that, let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, there's nothing that I have in my wisdom or ability this worthy of anyone coming to listen to. I have nothing to offer. But God, through your spirit, and through the power of your word, there is a message and there's an opportunity for your word to be heard here. Father, I pray that your word and your spirit would reign supreme in this place and that our purpose for being here would become evident and that we would know that you have spoken to us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Question number one, all about young people in the Bible. He was Moses' young servant. Who are we talking about here? He was Moses' young servant. Who was the guy that traveled along with Moses and helped him? The Bible describes him as a young man. What's his name? Amelia? You are right, Joshua. Joshua, oh man, we need to learn these stories, guys. That's a great one. Joshua is one of my favorite characters in the Bible. You know, Boaz saw a young lady and desired to know more about her. What was her name? Yeah. Ruth, you got it. That's right. He was a major prophet who said, Alas, Lord God, I don't know how to speak. I'm nothing but a youth. Which major prophet are we talking about? I was going to give the kids a chance. Raise your hand. <laughs> if you're new here, is that Russell who was shouting out? Wow, Amelia, you got to train. You know your dad. <laughs> Toby? It's not Samuel, but I like where you're thinking. Not Samuel. He's one of the major prophets, so it's either going to be that he has a, a Bible book named after him. You can guess. It's okay. Is that... Jeremiah, that's right. Jeremiah, when he was called, he was probably very young. And he was concerned about that. The youngest of all the apostles. Who are we talking about? Who is the youngest apostle? It's one of 12. <laughs> is that Jonathan here? Yeah. Say it again. John, and you, you share a name with him. That's right. John, the brother of James, almost positive that he was probably about 14 years old. 
almost. I mean, some Bible commentators will argue he could have been 16 or 17, but um, it, it's pretty clear that he had uh, he was over the age of 13, uh, but, but both by tradition, but also because of the historical uh, realities that we know. But John was probably 14 years old when he was one of Jesus' apostles. Most of the apostles were probably teenagers, by the way. Most of them, with the exceptions being Peter and Andrew. Peter and Andrew were probably in their early 20s. And we only know that because of tradition. Again, I can't show you chapter and verse, but things like Peter having to pay the temple tax, but none of the other apostles did. Okay, You only had to pay the temple tax if you were over the age of 20. Okay, So you just have little hints there. I don't force it upon you. I'm not going to uh, twist your arm or anything, but historically and uh, in, in the context, we know that the, all the apostles were probably pretty young. John being the youngest of them probably in the neighborhood of 14 years old. I don't know what I do, but I do this every week. So uh, it's not just you, Jeff. It's... Now it's not uh, advancing for me better. I feel like doing the Jeopardy theme song. Uh-oh, you weren't looking, were you? You weren't paying attention when you, all right. This young woman was told, uh, was not yet married when Gabriel told her she was going to have a baby. Oh, Emma, what do you have to say on this? Do you know it? You are so smart, Mary. Mary, the mother of Jesus. How old was she? I think she was younger than a lot of you would be comfortable contemplating. Um, again, just by the historical knowledge and, and things like that, uh, she was almost certainly a teenager. Almost certainly Mary was a teenager when she received the message from Gabriel. And again, I don't mean to disrupt your sensibilities, and we can arm wrestle about it later if you want to talk about it, but um, that is a, a possibility. This young man fell out of a window in Acts, and he was picked up dead. Remember him? You want to raise your hand if you know this one? I'll give you a hint. His name was in my title. What would you say it again? Eutychus. That's right. That's kind of how I pronounce it at least. I'm not sure if that's the accurate Greek. Um, I don't know, Nassim. You may have to do this for the rest of the time for me because I'm just not... Uh, I don't know if that was me or you. We'll, we'll see how it goes. If you have your Bibles, you can open up to Acts chapter 20. I'm just going to jump right into um, the Bible this morning after all the other preliminaries and things I've said. <laughs> after the quiz, I'm uh, going to jump right into the Bible story. And uh, I know you're probably somewhat familiar with this story. You've probably read it before if you've engaged with the book of Acts at any length. And uh, you may recall the story of, of this young man and, and what happened to him. But we're just going to spend a few minutes this morning uh, reviewing the story of the curious case of young Eutychus. Um, Luke is the author of Acts, and he's speaking here in the first person. So he says, we sailed, we meaning him and Paul and a little bit of their group, we sailed from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread and came to them at Troas within five days and stayed there seven days. And I always like to know where I am. There's Philippi, there's Troas. And so they moved from Philippi down to Troas here. That's part of Greece into the western part of modern day Turkey. And uh, that's where they are. Um, Troas is where uh, Paul had the original Macedonian vision when God uh, showed him a vision and said, uh, a man of Macedonia came to him and said, come over to us and talk to us as well. And so uh, Troas was a very important city because it's where the European missionary uh, uh, journey of the apostles begins. I've actually been there to Alexander Troas, and it's a, 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 you know mostly ruins and things today, but it's a very important historical city. So that's where we are. Paul's coming to that city in Troas, and Luke says that that's where they're going. Maybe we should just stick uh, <laughs> in our Bible. Verse 7 says, On the first day of the week, when we had gathered together to break bread, Paul began talking to them, intending to leave the next day, and he prolonged his message until midnight. Now, uh, uh, any of you that have interacted with the Sabbath question may have been introduced to this passage as well. As a matter of fact, this was the very first Bible passage when I was beginning to accept and believe in the Sabbath, and I began talking with my pastor at the time about it in, in another church, in another denomination. This was the very first verse he wanted to point me to about why Sunday should be the Sabbath. And uh, he said, no, 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 the Sabbath is not the seventh day. We know the early church 
uh, uh, kept the, the first day of the week, and we see them here in Acts chapter 20. They're obviously having a Bible meeting on the first day of the week, so we know that the, the Sabbath has been changed from, from Sabbath to Sunday. And, you know, I w- I'd heard that before I was prepared for it, and I said, you know, the early church, they met every day of the week. Paul makes it very clear, or excuse me, the author Luke, um, in Acts chapter 2, it says they were meeting every day from house to house, breaking bread. And just because they're having a meeting, I'm not sure that justifies the... Anyway, so I, I, I kind of went through my hesitation about that, and, and that uh, uh, I wasn't prepared to throw uh, uh, the, the Seventh-day Sabbath to the side simply because of this verse. Um, and I'll just share with you that the, the typical thing after that is, is, is also for them to, then to go to Romans 14 and say, well, really the Sabbath didn't get changed. It's just that the Sabbath, it doesn't really matter what day we keep. You know, because Romans 14 says a man regards the day, another man doesn't regard the day, let each man be persuaded. So really it doesn't matter what day we keep. And then when you wrestle with that a while, they'll eventually get to the case to the point where they say, well, the Sabbath itself doesn't really matter anymore. And that was kind of the, the journey that uh, I went through with, with uh, individuals who w- wanted to be persuasive. They always want to start by saying, oh, it's been changed. And then they want to go to, well, no, it doesn't really matter which day as long as you keep a day. But eventually they will come to the point where they just have to throw it aside altogether and say, no, actually that command doesn't really matter at all anymore. And it's one of these things that in the Bible passage alone, I kind of wish Luke had just left it out. Because the whole point of this story has nothing to do with the day of the week that it happened. I mean, the whole point that Luke recorded this story is because of of what happens with Eutychus. But if you get into a lot of commentaries, you get a lot of discussions, they will focus almost exclusively on the day of the week that it happened and almost ignore the greater part of the story of what happens to Eutychus. But be that as it may, the way I understand this is Paul had spent a week in Troas. He'd probably worship with them on the Sabbath. And for Jews, a day began at sunset. Okay, A day began at sunset. So the first day of the week for Paul and for Jews would have been Saturday night. At least it could have been. And because this is an evening meeting, and this is something that commentators don't really struggle with, they all agree, for the most part, that this was an evening meeting. So the way I see it is they'd worship together on the Sabbath. Paul was planning to leave on Sunday, but they had the Apostle Paul. I mean, it'd be like having, you know, Dwight Nelson here. I mean, we'd want to have as much of him as we could, right? we say, could you please stay? We want to hear more. You're just such a gifted speaker. You're doing so many great things. And that's what Paul did. He said, all right, we've had the Sabbath together. I'm leaving. We'll continue to fellowship. Let's have our evening meal, and we'll continue to discuss the scriptures. Okay, so I just I share that with you as the context here. They were gathered together on the first day of the week, probably Saturday night, okay? And they began talking with him, intending to leave the next day, and he prolonged his message until midnight. Now that's a Bible study, huh? Yeah, praise God. I won't keep you here to midnight, guys. Uh, I'll have you out by 1130. That's my commitment. All right, verse 8. And uh, I'm just going to need you to do it for me, this team. Now, it's interesting here. Luke points out in verse 8. Now, there were many lamps in the upper room where we were gathered together. And it seems like such a, a an irrelevant comment in the story. What are the lamps have anything to do with. But you have to, again, get into the story and get into the context. These were not, you know, fluorescent lamps or, you know, little light bulbs that were turned on. These were oil-burning fire lamps, okay? So if you picture it, it's dark, it's the summer, it's the desert, they're in an upper room, they're in a packed house, and you have a bunch of burning lamps. What, What kind of environment does that suggest to you? Stuffy, hot, right? Lacking oxygen. And that's what Luke is trying to tell us, that there were all these lamps. There's all these, and by the way, they stayed until midnight. They carried their lamps around like flashlights. That's how they lived in the ancient world, okay? They made sure they had lamps. So everyone in that place probably had their lamp, and they're all burning, and it is hot, it is, uh, it is stuffy, and it's packed, and they're, they're just preaching along. And, and the light is burning, and that's all glorious and wonderful. And that's partly the context that Luke wants to bring us to. And then he mentions there was a young man named Eutychus sitting on the windowsill, sinking into deep sleep. And here comes the whole point of the story that Luke is recording this through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He wants us to understand that there was a person there by the name of Eutychus. Um, and he gives us a few identifiers for Eutychus. First, he calls him a young man. And later on, a few verses later, he'll use another word for him that's often translated lad or boy. And these words had meaning in the Greek language, just like we would say adolescent or teenager or millennial, okay? We, we mean a certain age group, all right, when we say that. And so did Luke when he said it. The point being that Eutychus was clearly a teenager, all right? He's clearly a teenager from the, from the verbiage and from the language that Luke is using. 
And he says that Eutychus is sitting on the windowsill. Now, why would he be on the windowsill? He's trying to get air. All right? It is stuffed. There are many lamps burning. It's late. He is tired. All right? He's a teenager. He's sitting on the windowsill because it's so stuffy and hot. And the preaching's going. And the light is burning. All right? And the word is being discussed. But Eutychus, he's in the windowsill. Now, think about that location for just a second. He's got one foot in the church, and he's kind of got one foot out of the church, doesn't he? He's kind of in the middle, right? He's on the fence. That's 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 the kind of physical, logistical position that Eutychus is in. I'm making a spiritual application here, right? Okay, he's not quite in the church, but he's not quite out of the church. He's on the windowsill, and he's falling asleep. And the preaching's going, and the light is burning, and it's getting later, and the preaching's going, and he's falling asleep. He's getting sleepy. He's getting sleepy, and he's in a precarious position. But does anyone notice poor Eutychus in this position? By the way, his name, Eutychus, which is amazing that Luke gives us his name. There's a lot of wonderful Bible people. We have no idea what their name is. I mean, prophets that did crazy things in the Old Testament. We don't know their name. Okay, Noah's wife's name. Do you know her name? Yeah, Mrs. Noah, that's, what, that's all we know. There are amazing people in the Bible we don't know, but we know his name. So I take note of that. What does Eutychus mean? It, it means good fortune. It means good luck. It means, it, we might call it in, in a more of a slang term, he, it means lucky. Lucky. That's literally what his name means. It's lucky. Makes me wonder if, if maybe this became his name maybe after the story, or maybe it's just ironic in the story that his name was lucky. Not so lucky what's about to happen to him, I should say, right now at this point. So you know the story. He's sinking into a deep sleep. Now notice what Luke says and as paul kept on talking now i believe that there's humor in the bible okay i i believe that there's irony i believe that there's sarcasm and here luke he's already mentioned the meeting's gone on till midnight and paul's preaching he didn't really have to say that he kept on talking but he did anyways he said and as paul droned on as he just kept going this this tragedy ensued he was overcome by sleep and fell down from the third floor and was picked up dead. Now, that's how you end a Bible meeting. That's how you know it's time to draw it to a close. When you preach so long, you have killed someone. That's when you say, maybe we should call it a night. But you know, the funny thing is they didn't stop. I just want you to, I, I want to pause here in the story just for a moment. They're having their meeting. Apostle Paul is preaching up a storm. Mysteries of Scripture being unraveled. The light is burning with truth, with energy. No one noticed that a young man was about to fall to his death. Now, you could analyze this, and, and by the way, I, I always try to you know check the major commentaries to see what historically preachers have said about this and, and and you know it's interesting the direction people go it's interesting how many want to blame Eutychus for this how how irresponsible of this young man he should have known he should have been like you know the Mary and Martha story he should have been at the feet of Paul sitting there right in the midst and what a lazy unfortunate but what was he doing in that window they want to blame Eutychus some want to blame the parents. Where were his parents? I mean, it's a good thing for the parents to bring the youth. We're glad that parents bring their youth to church. We want the youth to be here. But where were the parents? And why wasn't dad looking out? Where was mom uh, to look out for Eutychus? Were they just uh, ignoring him? They want to blame the parents. Some want to blame the preacher. But we won't talk about that. I actually read an article. It was a very... Uh, um, bitter article, I guess it would say. They called Eutychus the first, uh, the first casualty of organized religion. Ooh. First of all, that doesn't make sense because isn't the Old Testament? Were there a lot of casualties in the Old Testament because of organized religion? So it was a fairly uh, polemical uh, article. But it was, a, you know, they're they're trying to put it in a New Testament with the new, uh, with the new developing church that here Eutychus, and some want to blame the church. Where were the elders? Where were the deacons looking out for the young? Where was the youth leader at this time, Vince? 
right? Where, where was the principal? Where were his teachers? Where was the preacher? Where was the pastor that's supposed to be? They want to do all these things. And at this time, Eutychus is dead on the ground. He's dead. But sometimes we want to play the blame game. Well, who's at fault? Why did this happen? Who's at fault? As this young man has just died. But then you come to the next verse. And it's verse 10, which is a wonderful verse that's going to pop up in your vision right at this moment. And there's so many of these wonderful transitions in Scripture, that often, and often they begin with this kind of just subtle, but, but Paul. We can argue, we can point fingers, we can play the blame game, but Paul was willing to take action. You know, throughout the Bible, you know, it says that, uh, uh, you know, uh, Abel, Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain, you know, was a tiller of the ground. Right? Uh, the earth was filled with wickedness, so that the thoughts and intentions of man was evil all the time. But Noah found favor with the Lord. You have these kind of powerful transitions. The time came when the kings went to war, and David sent out Joab and his armies to defeat Ammon, and they encamped around Reba. But David stayed in Jerusalem. There's these kind of pregnant moments, right? And here I think there's one of those, but Paul. We can, lay, we can point fingers. You can say, why did this happen? Who did it? But Paul was willing to do something. First, he went down. He went down. They're on the third floor. But Paul went down. Okay? He was willing to get off of his hobby horse. All right? He was willing to humble his pride. He was willing to stop what he was doing. He was willing to go down to the place where Eutychus was lying, where his broken body was. While everyone else may have, whether in, in uh, a scriptural application or in the uh, story itself, may have been trying to point the finger, figure out, why are these young people falling out of the church? Like maybe we should write a book about it. While others actually get up and go down. They are willing to go down. And not just go down, it says he fell upon him. Now, he's doing what the, the, the prophets had done. Elijah did this when he raised a young man. Elisha also did this. If you remember your Bibles, when the young man died. It's, it's they, they fall upon him. They actually kind of uh, prostrate themselves on the person who died. And in the story of Elisha, it says he put his hand to his hand, his, face, his eyes to his high, eyes, his mouth to his mouth. He was just totally identified with them. Luke uses the exact same word here when he talks about the Holy Spirit that fell upon Cornelius in his house when they became uh, Christians and accepted the message of Jesus Christ. He used the very same word that the Holy Spirit fell upon them. Isaiah 53 says, For he was pierced for our transgressions, and he was crushed for our iniquities, and the chastening of our well-being fell upon him. And by his wounds we are healed. It's an idea of intercession. It's an idea of intervention. It's an idea of identifying with the person who's suffering. Aren't you glad that Jesus was willing to identify with us and intercede for us? This is what Paul is doing. He fell upon him and he embraced him. He embraced him. He took him in his arms. He hugged him. He showed compassion and mercy for him. And he realized that there was a tragedy that had just ensued. And he pled for God's mercy upon this young teenager who had just fallen out of the church. One in eight teenagers will stay in the church. One in eight. According to all the latest data, one in eight. I want to do a little graphic illustration. Will you indulge me for just a moment? If you are a teenager, would you help me out for a second? If you're a teenager, would you stand up? Please, would you help me out? If you're a teenager, would you stand up? We love you guys. We believe in you. We value you. We think God has great plans for you. We think it's no accident that you're here at this church, that you're here on this campus. We think that God believes in you and has purpose for your life. And we believe that the devil wants to destroy you. We believe that the devil wants to kick you out. And we believe that the distractions of this world 
and the temptations and the priorities of this world are in conflict with the plan of God in your life. And I want you guys to beat the statistic. And we want to support you in that. I don't want to see one in eight of you in the church ten years from now. I want you guys to understand God's plan for you and to know that He has a place for you in His kingdom and in His work until He comes. He is preparing a place in heaven for you. You may be seated. Thank you so much. I love how Paul, in this experience, he, he goes down and he intercedes. He falls upon Eutychus. He embraces Eutychus. And then he says, don't be troubled. Don't be troubled. He still has his life in him. God has restored and redeemed and resurrected. Even if they do fall out and for all intents and purposes perish, is it too late? Is it too late? How many of you know uh, a friend that you grew up with or a young person that walked away at some point in their faith? Is it too late for them? Can we still go to them? Can we still intercede for them? Can we still embrace them? And can we still plead the blood of Jesus in their life? And can God still restore them? Absolutely. It's never too late for anyone. When he'd gone back up, they had broken bread and eaten. They talked a long while until daybreak and then left. The Bible service continued. I think that's hilarious. And it gets the idea of it's almost kind of a comma along the way, almost like a pause. It's all right, guys. Eutychus is great. Oh, by the way, remember what Isaiah said? Let's go back up and keep talking about it because it's wonderful. They don't allow the mission. It's not that what they were doing in the church was wrong. You understand what I'm saying? They were studying their Bibles. The light was burning brightly. They were studying. But in the midst of that, they lost sight of an important soul. And when they were able to restore that soul, the work, the good work of encouraging and blessing one another continued. They took the boy away alive and they were greatly comforted. I bet mom and dad were awfully excited that they had their beauty kiss back. You know, I think there's a lot of Eutychuses today. That's a hard word to say plurally. You know, I think we're getting pretty close to midnight. You know, biblically, prophetically. I think, I think that we're not too far from midnight. And, I, and I'm glad that we are preaching the word with all fervor. And we're not going to give up doing that. And I'm glad the light burns bl brightly in his church today. We are a people of the Spirit. We are a people of the Word. And we are going to preach the Word, and we are going to burn that light until Jesus comes. Amen? But it's getting closer to midnight. And there are still young people in the window wondering what their next steps are. And it is not for us to wag our finger and say, well, if they were better kids, if they had better parents, if only the church would. Sure, all those elements are important part of the family dynamic that we can all be a part of. But sometimes we need to be a little bit more understanding. And maybe before they fall out of the window, maybe before they get to that point, maybe we could get to know them. Maybe we could look out for them. Maybe we could intercede for them before that happens. Maybe we could embrace a few young people in prayer, in support, and in love. I'm going to close with a video. And this is actually a commercial. Uh, it's uh, for uh, Apple. I'm not here to promote a product. I want to make that clear. Uh, but I think it was an interesting portrayal of understanding uh, young people. And uh, it's kind of a, in the Christmas context. But I want you to take a look at it and see if you... Uh, See if you kind of notice what the point of that video is. So if you guys, thank you.
Did you get it? Did you get it? Did you get it? Did you catch it? Did you get it? Did you get it? For better or for worse, this is part of our world. There's a lot of evils that come along with you. He was on his phone, it looked like, the entire time, not engaged, not paying attention. But in actuality, he was putting together a creative expression for his family. And you understand that until the end. Sometimes we are too quick to judge. Sometimes we're too quick to assume. Sometimes we're too quick to blame. God is doing great things in the hearts and minds of our young people. Let's catch them before they fall out of that boat. Heavenly Father, Lord, we know that we're living in complicated days. And we know that there's an enemy who is at work constantly. But Lord, we know that you have overcome the enemy. And that if we stay close to you, we keep our hearts open, we will see the great things that you are doing in our world and among our people. Lord, I pray that you would bless everyone who's here and give them a passion for young people, even if it just means to be more patient, more thoughtful. Yes, some of us need to actually come down, though. Some of us need to humble our hearts. And begin to look through the eyes that you want us to look through, Lord. Help us to be those who care that there are those falling. And that we be willing to intercede and embrace. And pull these young people back into your family. Lord, thank you that we live in this day. That we get to see the things that you're about to do. God. Help us to be right in the middle of your plan. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, If you're staying for potluck, it'll start just momentarily. Hope that you can come back next week. Even though it's Labor Day weekend, I realize that. We're still going to have church. We look forward to seeing you. God bless.